Hello everyone, myself Dr. Andhruti Shah Rathi, currently working as an assistant professor, Government Degree College, Bukhar. The paper today we are looking at is 20th century drama and in this module we are going to talk about Samuel Beckett waiting for Godot. In this lecture module, I am going to speak about Samuel Beckett's life. Then we are going to talk about uh, the major works of Samuel Beckett. Then I am going to throw light on the theatre of Absurd. What are the major characteristics of the theatre of Absurd? And finally, we are going to do the analysis of the play and we are going to discuss about the different themes which are being mentioned in the play. Let us first have a look at Samuel Beckett's life. He was Irish. He was born in Ireland in Dublin into an Anglo-Irish family. He graduated in modern languages, French and Italian at Dublin Trinity College. Then in 1928, he worked as a lecturer at Ecole Normale. He was influenced by the French existentialism, especially by the work of Camus and Sartre. He was only 25 years of age when he decided to lead his life as a vagabond in Europe. And then finally, he moved to Paris in 1936. It was 1936 when the World War II broke out. He fought for the resistance movement in France. And in 1945, he met James Joyce. Beckett basically wrote in two languages, English and French. Waiting for Godot, which was premiered in 1956, was his first and the most famous play. He won Nobel Prize for Literature in 1969. His important works include In Prose, The Proust, which was published in 1931. He has published three novels, Murphy in 1935, Malone in 1951, The Unnameable in 1960. His collections of poetry include Echoes, Bones and Other Precipitates. His important plays are Waiting for Godot, which was written in 1956, Endgame in 1957, Crap's Last Tape in 1958, Happy Days in 1961. And other works. Samuel Beckett along with Eugene Ionesco is considered as the father of theatre of absurd. If you just look towards the historical background of the theatre of absurd, it is uh, the outcome of the World War the Second especially the aftermath of World War II, the worsen situation between Russia and United States. The atrocities which were being used by the Nazis concentration camp and the Allies used atomic bomb in Japan. There was a new sense of anguish, helplessness and despair which generated inside the young generation. The young generation looked toward 
adopts the word as they were totally aware of the destructive forces of the scientific knowledge. Apart from that, there was a kind of a lack of moral existence. Morality was something which was being lost because there was a decline in uh, the faith or there was a decline of religious faith. There was a sense of disillusionment which created a sense of more helplessness because there was a kind of a difference between the economic and the social progress. A sense of mistrust was there because the mistrust in the power of reason created a sense of anguish. Existentialism saw man trapped in a hostile world. Human life was meaningless and this created a sense of confusion, despair and emptiness. The universe was not rational. It was defied of any explanation. The universe was seen as absurd and there was a kind of a development in this philosophical current by Albert Camus and Sartre. Now if we just look towards the uh, drama or the post-war drama, after the Second World War in 1950, there was a kind of a revival of a drama in uh, British literature which showed the rejection of the traditional values. There were two major trends which developed in the post-war drama. The first trend deal, dealt with the theatre of anger and the second one was absurd. So first of all, we will deal with the theatre of anger. The theatre of anger or the angry young man group were the educated middle class playwrights. So they were completely, uh, they, these young people were having a kind of a left wing ideas. The plays which were being performed were uh, not innovative but they were realistic. They rejected the traditional norms but they emphasized on a kind of a content. Okay, The content was something which was being uh, emphasized on and they, it, the content was the class consciousness, the left wing class consciousness. It was the frustration of younger generation who rejected the middle class values and they wanted to expose their unfair situation. The, lang the language which was being used was direct and it was the language which was being used by the working class people. And if we, the main exponent or the main example of this uh, angry young man and theater of anger is John Osborne look back in anger and that was something which was being performed around 1956. Now let us look towards the second one that is the theater of absurd. Now let us look towards the uh, second trend of the drama that is the theatre of absurd. When we talk about the theatre of absurd, theatre of absurd was something which was being influenced by the existentialism. There was a kind of an influence of Camus and Sartre. 
when we just look towards this kind of an influence there is a kind of a pessimistic view of man's existence there is no purpose at all uh, the life is totally absurd why because it can be considered as the uh, impact of the two world war because man has seen uh, the two world war and that is something which is being uh, considered as no faith in the religion with no belief man is someone who is completely lost and there is a kind of a big existential question and that is what is the purpose of human existence it raised a kind of a question that is what is the purpose of life what is the purpose of human existence when we just look towards the word absurd absurd means no meaning at all that is no rational meaning at all and beckett's play want to represent this absurdity this irrationality of the human existence and for this he knew, he used a new innovative technique or for this he used a new form of drama which was known as the theater of absurd when we just look towards the term theater of absurd the term was uh, something which was being applied by different different playwrights different different uh, dramatists Inesco, uh, Eugene, Eugene Neal, uh, Adamov, as well as Samuel Beckett. So, absurd is not a kind of a school. So, uh, this is what we people can say. Ki they did not want to create a kind of a school, but all of them were working at their own places. And it actually generated a kind of a form which can be considered as the absurd drama. Now, if we just look towards uh, the uh, the kind of uh, the, when we talk about the term absurd the absurd term is something which is being taken from uh, the essay written by Albert Camus and the name of that essay is myth of Sisyphus in this uh, Sisyphus is the protagonist he is a great a Greek protagonist who is being asked to roll a rock on the top of the mountain so the more he pushes it up he is not the more the rock comes down he's cursed so this kind of situation shows the barrenness the futility of the human existence now let's see how the absurd drama is uh, differentiated from the traditional drama what is the difference between the traditional drama and the absurd drama now let us look towards the difference between the traditional drama traditional form of the drama and the theater of absurd if we just look towards the first segment that is the plot so there in a traditional form of a drama there is a kind of a story which develops with time and when we talk about the theater of absurd there is no story no plot it's a kind of a static word where nothing happens now the second point that is when we look towards the characters so the characters are very very realistic they actually connect with the audience they uh, act there is a certain period of time and in that manner they uh, perform their action but when we talk about the characters which are being mentioned in the theater of absurd they do not interact with each other they do not communicate they just try to break a kind of a silence 
so here this is what uh, we people can say and in the meantime they even even they do not communicate with the audience also there is a sense of alienation uh, which brech has mentioned as a war from dung's effect now um, the time which is the another feature of a traditional um, play or a traditional drama there is a sequence the events are narrated according to the time everything happens on a specific time but when we just uh, talk about uh, the theater of absurd we do not have time the time is like a kind of a nightmare it's something which is very situational or they do not exist in the time they do not remember uh, their past they do not remember their purpose the characters they do have a kind of a weak memory the next feature of a traditional drama is the language when uh, the characters communicate there is uh, they communicate and make a kind of a proper sense between each other on the other hand when we people are talking about uh, the theater of absurd no language is being used silence pauses is something which is being used apart from that if they will speak the language which is being used is gibberish so these are uh, some of the major differences and uh, if we just look towards a traditional form of a drama a traditional form of a drama is something which has a kind of a beginning it has a kind of a middle it has a kind of an end there is a kind of a rising action there is a kind of a falling action and a kind of a climax in the traditional form of a drama but uh, when it is being compared with the theater of absurd there is no rising action there is no uh, it, it's there is no beginning there is no end the play doesn't end it's something a kind of a situation which is being repeated things are kept as it is it actually wanted to show the kind of uh, absurdity so this is something which is uh, a major difference between the traditional form of the drama and uh, the theater of absurd now uh, we will just move towards the next segment in which we are going to talk about uh, waiting for godo let's talk about waiting for godo Waiting for Godot was actually written in French language. The title was An Attendant Godot. Later, it was being translated into English by Samuel Beckett himself. It was first performed in London. Waiting for Godot was one of the most revolutionary play of the 20th century. In this play, Beckett experimented with a minimalism, a technique employed to create a artistic effect uh, with minimum possible means when the play was first performed many spectators left the theater because they could not understand anything the audience was totally confused at the strange dialogues characterization and the lack of plot or the story some critics see the play as a reflection of beckett's own military experience during the second world war the play waiting for godo is a tragic comedy in two acts it has only five characters who appears on stage the sixth character godo is someone who doesn't appear at stage at all the title refers to the protagonist waiting endlessly for the godo now let us look at the summary of the play the play is something which has been divided into two acts so first of all i am going to give you the summary of act 1 as well as the analysis of the act 1 and then i am going to talk about the act 2 so let's begin 
with the first act the setting the first act begins in the evening on a lonely country road near the tree with no leaves a middle aged tramp Estragon is seating is seated on a low mound struggling to take off his boots when vladimir arrives estragon gives up his frustrated attempts exclaiming nothing to be done his words resound throughout the play emphasizing on the absurdity of life vladimir surprisingly comes up with a rather strange but a philosophical response i am beginning to come around to the opinion all my life i have tried to put it from me saying vladimir be reasonable you do you haven't yet tried everything so critics have remarked that beckett creates the right atmosphere of the play with vladimir abstract dialogue it reflects the true nature of the human existence in the modern age man seems to be unable to find a worthy reason to live happily beckett present his character as a pro- prototype of a post war modern age man they are always tormented with worries of disease poverty homelessness hunger suffering and other issues estragon is dressed in rags and was beaten he keeps complaining about pain in his feet vladimir peers inside his heart for a while and refers to his itching blood bladder illness they try to pass the time by exchanging heart playing games they converse on various topics and reveal that they are waiting for a man named kodo while they wait two other men enter that is pozo and lucky they share a master slave relationship Pozo is on his way to the market to sell his slave Lucky. The tramps encounter with the old couple Pozo and Lucky seems symbolic in many ways. Beckett seems to suggest that human beings are fated to undergo suffering in different ways. Pozo is a very tyrant master and Lucky is someone who is still dependable on pozo even pozo is tyrannical in nature lucky is not leaving the pozo so again the situation is something which is talking about the absurdity of the life the first act ends up with the arrival of the boy the messenger godo he informs them that kodo is unable to come but he will meet them surely next day the boys leave and they decides to leave the place however the characters they do not move there is no advancement of the plot in the first act through vladimir and estragon pozo and lucky beckett seems to highlight the human condition prevalent during the modern age man though disappointed and frustrated with life does nothing to change his condition he waits passively and relies on hope to sustain him and enable him to face the future so again through the act 1 itself it is being defined that there is a kind of an absurdity nothing is happening nothing is changing but still uh, the characters they rely on a kind of a hope and that hope is something which can be considered as a new beginning in the life itself in their life itself apart from this we have seen one more thing that in act 1 the two character even try to commit a suicide but they are unable to do this so 
it is reflected in such a kind of a manner where nothing could be done. They are just based on a kind of a hope and they think that once Godo will arrive, all their problems are going to come to an end. Now, let's look towards Act 2. So, when we just talk about Act 2, the second act is set in the same surrounding. The tree has sprouted four or five leaves. Estragon has left his boots there in the previous night. Vladimir enters agitated and starts singing about a dog beaten to death because it stole a crust of bread. Soon Estragon enters. He is sad because he is beaten again the previous night. Vladimir prompts him to recollect the events of the previous day. Estragon is unsure about the passage of time. He doesn't remember anything. Vladimir suggests helping Estragon to put his boots again. Estragon says that the boots are not his. This leads them to an absurd thought. Pozo and Lucky appears again as master and slave. But this time the condition is different. Pozo is blind and Lucky is not able to hear anything. Pozo and Lucky appears as master and slave again. Pozo, who is now blind, falls down and calls for the help. Estragon again mistakes him to be Godo. The tramp wonder why Lucky haven't escaped from the blind Pozo. Instead of helping Pozo, he chats with Estragon, contemplating about their fates. Pozo keeps on calling out for help and offers up to 200 francs. This spurs Vladimir to take action. He says, let's do something. Why? We have a chance. It's not every day that we are needed. Not needed that we personally are needed. Others would meet the case equally well. If not better, to all mankind, they were addressed those cries for help still ringing in our ears. But at this place, at this moment of time, all mankind is in us, whether we like it or not. Let us make the most of it before it's too late. Let us represent worthily for once the foul brood to the cruel fate consigned us. Vladimir fails in his attempt and falls down calling for help. The scene is extremely tragic comic with three of them lying on the ground calling for help. The tram get up on their own after some time to help Pozo to get up. Estragon wakes up, Lucky who is mute, then master and slave exist. Exit. It's strange that only Vladimir remembers the event of the previous day. The boy returns in the end of Act 2 with a message from the Godo again asking for Mr. Albert. The boy doesn't recognize Vladimir but he says that Godo will surely meet them the next day. Boy reveals that Godo has a white beard and runs off from the stage. 
The play ends with the trance standing in front of the tree, seriously considering the possibilities of hanging themselves. But these two trams do not have any rope. So they think of bringing the rope next day. Vladimir says that they will not hang themselves until or unless Godot arrives in order to save them. Vladimir helplessness word confirms the endless fate. Now, if we just look towards the kind of the conclusion which are being mentioned in the text itself, this is what Vladimir says. We wait. We are bored. He throws up his hand. No, don't protest. We are bored to death. There is no denying in it. Good. A diversion comes along. And what do we do? We let it go to waste. Come, let's get to work. He advances towards the heap, stops in, the, in his stripes. In an instant, all will vanish and we will alone once more in the midst of nothingness. So here again, the play, the end of the play suggests the infinite possibilities of waiting. Apart from this, this is what it is being shown that human beings are so opposed to change that they would rather prefer inactive or unproductive. When we just look towards the character of Vladimir and Estragon, they actually portray the modern man. They represent the modern man itself. Even though the play is a tragic comedy, but it actually mirrors the human existence. Now let's look towards the theme of the play. The play has several themes. The main theme of the play is waiting. It has alienation, anxiety, nihilism. There is an approach toward nihilism. It represents the boredom of the life. Again, it represents uh, the vain expectations. There is a theme of friendship which is being reflected in the play itself and so on. The play doesn't come to an end. What is much more fascinating about Waiting for Godot is that the play Waiting for Godot never ends. So again, this play is something which is being kept in front of everyone to explore new possibilities. By this words, I just end up my lecture. Hope you have understood the lecture well. Thank you.